All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, maybe Amanda or somebody can give me a heads up, make sure that the, I can be heard. Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Sounds good. All right, thanks. All right, good night. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, here we are week four, I believe, right? of our uh, community academy here in the University Police Police Department. Uh, again, Greg Primo, your chief of police, and joined as well with my co-facilitator, Jennifer Hales, our public safety administrator for the city. Um, this week's class is gonna be on the code responder program. Uh, I know that everyone's had a little bit of a introduction to what that is from some of our other presenters, but tonight we're obviously gonna go a little bit more in depth as we have three co-responders here with us to talk about the program and answer your questions about, uh, you know, mental health services that are being provided out in the field, you know, with that whole, all the, you know, we talked about crisis intervention, training and de-escalation stuff that the deputies uh, go through and the training that's involved. And obviously one of their resources are the co-responders. So we're excited to, to hear about that program and, and they're here to answer questions and give you all kinds of information on that uh, tonight. So. Uh, again, just a reminder, it looks like everybody's doing it already, but uh, make sure that your cameras stay off on your on your systems and keep your microphones muted. Utilize your chat function to ask questions. I think everything's been working really well so far uh, with the program on that. So hope to continue that tonight. Um, and I think that's about it. We're going to go ahead and transition into the presentation part now. Um, so you should see that coming up. So it'll give us just a second to get the cameras up and those microphones turned on. All right, thanks. So hi, my name is Ross. I am one of the five co-responders that works in the, in the county. Um, my background before I came to be a co-responder was I actually was a high school teacher for 10 years. I taught um, in Port Orchard at South <laughs> Kitsap High School. I think that prepared me to work with people that have uh, emotional uh, challenges. And I also worked at a church for about 10 years, and there I was a counselor. I decided that I wanted to kind of focus in on um, the more chronically uh, mentally ill, and I worked for 10 years as what's called a designated crisis responder in Kitsap County. A designated crisis responder, we're the ones in the county that can make the legal determination that somebody meets criteria legally to be detained against his or her will to a psychiatric unit. It starts off with for about 72 hours and then a doctor makes a decision uh, when they can be released and a little more about that later. But so I did that for 10 years in Kitsap, moved down to Pierce County um, when this co-responder program uh, came about because when I first heard about it, I thought, I think that's how it should have been from the beginning. The idea that what we're doing has to do with law enforcement. We are taking the law and applying it to people that are having mental um, problems and challenges and seeing if they meet um, the criteria to be in a psychiatric hospital. The great thing about it is the program has become so much more than just evaluating for legal criteria. So tonight, I'm going to start off by telling you um, some of the purposes and some of the, the beginning uh, history of this program. It's not a very long history, so it won't take too long. OK, the next, the first slide. So I'm going to talk about purposes and partnerships and the beginning of the program. And then my coworker, Victoria, is going to go over program logistics, which is basically how, how do we do it in the day to day. And then Alex is going to go over how are we doing? Um, what is actually happening in a bigger picture um, with this idea that we had about what a co-responder program could be? So here it says the purpose is that the Sheriff's Department adopted the co-responder model to improve engagement with people experiencing behavioral and mental health issues. Um, this broadens out even to people that or having mental health issues because of substance abuse or alcohol intoxication. Um, whenever somebody's cognitive um, behavioral um, actions are out of the norm concerning, um, they wanted them to have a resource. 
Um, there's so many 911 calls. We've kind of conditioned our society to call 911 when you're in a crisis. If you don't know exactly what to do, call 911. And as you can imagine, so many of the 911 calls that come in have mental health components. It can be as direct as um, I'm suicidal or my wife is saying she's suicidal or has overdosed on medication. Or it could be something more vague like my son is going crazy or having a mental breakdown. Um, we are watching those 911 calls, and so we have some awareness of it. And when the deputies feel like it's appropriate, they ask us to come on the scene. Um, sometimes it's so obvious if a person's overdosing, they need to go to the hospital. They don't even call us. They call medics and get the person to the hospital. But other times when it's especially kind of a grayer area is when the co-responders really can come to shine. Um, an example that comes to my mind is um, a pretty routine kind of call came in from, I think it was a Walgreens. There was a, a young man in a parking lot acting crazy right? on drugs, drunk, talking to himself. Nobody knew exactly. They wanted him checked on and maybe moved along. He was kind of freaking out. The customers. So the deputies got there and they pretty quickly realized he's not even really answering our basic questions. So they asked me to show up. Say I had the same thing. We would get, you know, a name and then he'd kind of mumble to himself and say things like, uh, I'm not a rapist. And just he, he was barely able to engage with us. It was pouring down rain. He was wearing socks. And um, I said to the deputies, I think this is probably meth but something else doesn't seem quite right. I'm very concerned about him. I think we should get him to a hospital. Called medics, got him to the hospital. I went to the hospital, talked to the doctor, the nurse, social worker, gave him the insight. The, the culmination of the story, at least as far as I know, is that about an hour later, I got a call from the social worker and said, yes, he tested positive for meth, but he's being taken to the ICU because he's in septic shock. I, uh, got kind of a chill because I, I, met, I messaged to the deputies and said, I think you guys saved somebody's life tonight. And uh, they kind of graciously wrote back and said, actually, it was you. We probably would have just let him go. You know, you know how many people we see that are just kind of a little out of it and not really doing anything wrong. So it was one of those examples of where um, the coming together of responding to a crisis with people that have a little bit more expertise um, in this case, possibly save somebody's life. Um, as you can see from this slide, one of the emphasis of our program is to try to save, divert from going to emergency rooms or jails um, when it's a mental health crisis. Um, it, it, we'll go into more detail about it, but sometimes the hospital is the only alternative, definitely. But there are plenty of times when it's, you know, it's not. We can go to the next slide. So some of the goals are first, uh, as I mentioned, diversions from jail and the emergency room, if appropriate, because it's a mental health crisis. Um, a, a good example of this, a, a similar kind of uh, situation. It was a young man. He was behind a, a parts store and he called 911 himself saying he either had a, I think he had a knife and he was having suicidal thoughts. Well, the deputies called me to the scene. When I got there, they said, we saw him last night. He was suicidal. We took him to the emergency room. Can you try talking to him? Um, pretty quickly into the conversation, I found out that he had these thoughts very routinely. Um, it was anxiety. And I think within 10 minutes, I had him de-escalated, relaxed. The deputies had taken the knife before I ever got there. And um, he decided he was, he was fine to go home. And I was able to find out who his outpatient providers were and contact them. So that saved him, the emergency room, the emergency room somebody, and the deputies from the time of taking somebody to the emergency room, which goes to next slide, or that next slide, sorry, the next line that the, it reduces the amount of time that law enforcement can spend in the emergency room. Some hospitals will make the deputies sit in the lobby with the patient. And you can imagine how long that can be sometimes. One of the things that's worked because a uh, co-responder is a little bit of a bridge. We're at the emergency room so often and have relationships that I'll often call up 
and say, hey, we're coming. Um, we're going to come through the ambulance bay and um, and then we can bypass the lobby. So <laughs> that's been great. Um, another one is sometimes, uh, you know, I think I've called 911 not professionally twice in my entire life. Um, we get people that have called over a thousand times in a year, which you can do the math. That's more than three times a day. Some of those people, it's not every day, they might call 30 times in a day. I've seen somebody will call up, yell something, hang up, and 30 seconds later, call back again. What we try to do is, as you can imagine, most of those are mental illness, <laughs> uh, and we try to intervene, contact the person, go to the person's house. Um, so we've been relatively successful. We'll talk a little bit about, about that later, but with the, the high frequency people that call 911, um, be, probably because they don't know what else to do. We give them an alternative. We, um, when we're on the scene, we often provide resources for family, education. Even if the person has gone to the hospital, we can still talk to the, the family. Or if the person's not going to the hospital, we can give them some resources and stuff. It, it doesn't rise to the level of hospitalization. So here are some things that you can do in a less disruptive manner. Um, we do a lot of consultations with law enforcement, especially in some of the farther out areas. They'll call up and say, hey, can you look this person up or can I talk to you about this case? I don't think the person needs to go to the emergency room, but I just buy you. Um, also, they'll say, you know, I've already left the house. You know, the person seemed fine, but could you call them in about an hour and just double check on them or see if they have any ideas of resources they might need? So hopefully this gives you a little idea and it'll be kind of fleshed out a little more later. Um, some of the goals that we have and some of the things that we're doing. A quick timeline is that this really started in Pierce County about 2016. Um, they did a, a study and one of the things that came out of the study was that uh, Pierce County sheriffs could have a more robust approach to dealing with people with mental illness and behavioral problems. That led one of the chiefs, Chief Heishman, to look into programs across the country. Um, you can see in 2017, they got a grant and they started investigating programs. They went to Kansas and Maryland. They then approached the county council and they got funding. They asked for two, got one, um, funding for one co-responder. But they also simultaneously were looking into grants. Um, there's a grant called True Blood. It's a, it's a bigger program that has to do with um, the mentally ill in the criminal justice system. And they got uh, approved for three co-responders. Um, then they also sought out another grant with WASPIC in 2019 that provided for two co-responders. Uh, so currently we have uh, funding for six and we currently have five. Um, one last slide for me. So I often get asked the question, oh, is this in response to, you know, all this going on in society, you know, defund police, defund police? Like, no, absolutely not. This is not defunding the police. This is supplementing. This is adding to. As you can already see from the slide I just showed you, this program started back in 2016. Um, but it has been uh, a way of providing additional things. I, I feel like even before I had this job, but even more so now, we ask so much of law enforcement, it's really absurd. No, no human being can be good at all the things we ask law enforcement to be good at. And I, I, I can't read their minds, but it does seem like when we show up, there's a certain level of like, oh, you know, I had one, um, one of the deputies say, oh, finally somebody knows what he's doing. Totally joking, obviously, <laughs> but it, it, it felt good that they, they were able to recognize that, you know, they, they're not experts at everything and to have somebody there that could support them and they didn't feel the weight of, you know, they have um, between 10 and 20 calls in a 10 hour shift. Think about it, that's, that's between one and two crises that they have to deal with every hour. And it's people that are suicidal, people that are, you know, um, need to be trespassed. I mean, it's crisis after crisis. And so be able to have a co-responder come and they can kind of step back for a minute and let somebody else step up has, has been great. Um, 
along the idea of defunding, the last thing that I wanted to share with you was um, it was right after George, George Floyd's death when America was really having the demonstrations and there was a lot of tension. And um, you might remember that time, there was so much tension. We got a call and it involved a family and the father seemed to be having some kind of mental breakdown and he had locked his wife out of the house. That in itself would not be a 911 call, but he was inside the house with their two young children. And the wife was panicking. She had never seen him like this before. She said he hadn't slept in days. Um, because children were involved, I think five deputies arrived and a sergeant and they called for a co-responder. When I got to the scene, um, extended family was already there. It was an African-American family. And I started talking with the man's mother who had shown up and um, just kind of getting information from her, but also reassuring her. And I said, I just happened to say, oh, you lucked out. These are some fantastic deputies. Uh, I know them personally. They're really wonderful. And she said, that's good to hear. I, I'm really anxious having them here. And I'm embarrassed to say it didn't even cross my mind that an African-American family in the midst of all that was going on would be anxious about law enforcement being at their house. Um, so they got the children out of the house. I asked if I could go in with family to talk to the, the son, father, husband, and, um, and law enforcement very quietly went in with me and kind of stood back. I sat on the couch with the family. The man was pretty manic. His, 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 th his thoughts were racing. He was minimizing it, but I had family there. And I was able to, to say, well, your mother here says that you haven't been sleeping. Well, yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> The brief of it is that um, with the help, it was like a, it was like an intervention, a very brief, very intense with law enforcement standing behind us intervention, and we got him to agree to go voluntarily to the hospital. The family asked, which I have never had family ask, can we take him to the hospital? Which I said, okay, if you're okay with, well, I asked the deputies first, is that okay? And they said, well, that'd be fine. And then off to the side, I asked the deputies to follow us to the hospital in case something happened along the way. As I said before, I called ahead. They had a room waiting for us. We walked in the ambulance bay doors straight to the room. The deputies kind of said, take care. And I was able to work with a family and the hospital. I talked to the family, I often follow up to see how things are going. And um, <clears throat> two different the family that I talked to on separate occasions said, will you please thank the deputies and law enforcement, we were so blown away with how helpful they were. We were frightened and they let us take the lead, but they were there to support us every step of the way. So I thought that was an incredible story. Yeah, question. Yes, we have a couple questions and this may get spread out between you guys also. Um, one of the participants is interested in knowing your opinions about the lack of mental hospitals and ho and homelessness. And then I have another follow up to that when you're done. Yeah, that is an ongoing problem in Washington state. I can't speak for nationally. Um, there has been more recently the opening of WellFound right in uh, Tacoma uh, by Alan Moore Hospital that has eased the system a little bit. Um, but it is a huge challenge um, when we when somebody's detained. Um, if we can't find a place for them, they end up staying in the emergency room and they start the treatment there. So, yes, that is a huge problem. Um, talk to your congressional people <laughs> about funding. What was the second and part? And the second part was just about homelessness. Oh, I don't feel like I can speak very clearly on homelessness because that hasn't been my specialty, but we did have a co-responder um, on our team that had spent a year as a co-responder with homelessness. And so I know this might be a little, uh, this is what she told me. She said that after a year of doing it, they had really canvassed the area and all the people that they came into contact with that had mental illness that crossed the legal threshold that they could force into services, they did. Um, the other people were that were mentally ill didn't quite meet. But most of the people were not that interested in resources, shockingly. So um, it is a much bigger social problem, 
psychological problem, then um, we often want to make it as human beings. Um, and I'm just speaking from what she told me. I think that's actually what we see too. Um, has the new mental health facility opened yet? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's well found. <clears throat> And that has been that has been very helpful. One of the things that's helpful about it is they, I don't work there, so um, but they have kind of a more of a crisis triage, so people can go there and like voluntarily check in. Again, I don't know exactly how that all works. So I've never uh, tried to check in, but um, <laughs> that's that's how that works. So that ha that has been that has definitely been helpful. We still have another one coming yeah. too. Yep. In your experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is six co-responder positions enough for the county? So oh. Is there a target number you would like to see the program reach? That's a great question. Um, six allows us to cover uh, seven days a week, about 20, I think it's 21 hours a day. We find that there's not a lot between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of allows us to have at least one person on. The, um, yeah, I would like to see there be more eventually, but so far we've been able to, to handle the flow of it. That's a great question. Okay, well, I'm going to pass it on to Victoria, who's going to be talking about uh, the model of what we do. Thank you, Ross. Yeah. So my name is Victoria. I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, I'm pretty new with the co-responder program. I've only been here for about seven months. I've been here since February. Um, before that, I was a child therapist for an agency, and I also worked in an emergency department as an emergency room social worker. Um, and my degree is in social work. That's kind of my, my background. Um, and like Ross said, I'll talk about the logistics of the program and how um, maybe they looks for a co-responder. Um, so to start kind of more broad, there's two co-responder models in the nation. So one is where a mental health professional or a co-responder is assigned to one law enforcement officer and spends the entire day with that, with that officer and going to mental health related calls. So this program has a few or this model has a few downsides because it takes one officer out of the rotation. Um, so it creates a new position and um, whenever that officer responds to a mental health call with a co-responder, they're kind of stuck until that crisis is resolved and can't go on other calls. And conversely, the co-responder with that officer is also stuck. So, for example, if a call is there's a mental health component, but really it's a civil issue or a criminal issue. The is stuck until the officer resolves that and can't go deal with other mental health calls. Um, so Pierce County Sheriff Department chose the other model, which is where the co-responder is dispatched by the 911 system and gets their own car, their own um, gear and uh, responds to calls on their own and is requested by an officer who's already at the scene, and then we meet them at the scene. Um, so it is a little more expensive because we, of course, need our own car, our own gear, some more training, but it's just a more efficient um, way of dealing with 911 calls. That's what we found. Oh, there's a question. Yes, um, there's one that kind of was a holdover from Ross, and I'll just kind of hit him now because I think we're going to get lots. Sure. Do you believe the issue is the gap between crisis and continued services? Mm. Maybe you can hit that, and then the mm. and then the other one wants to know what kind of gear you have. Okay, I'll talk about the gear in the next slide. Um, I definitely think that there's definitely a gap between crisis and getting connected to services. So somebody has a crisis and maybe law enforcement responds and um, is able to de-escalate the crisis um, and the crisis is resolved in the moment and they leave. It doesn't address the broader issues that caused the crisis. And so that makes it pretty likely that the same crisis is going to happen again. So that's one thing that the co-responder program does address is like Ross was saying, we do follow-ups call the family the next day, see how they're doing, see um, what services they need and help connect them to those services. And I'll have a few examples of 
um, scenarios where that was done. <clears throat> um, so this slide is kind of a recap of the last slide. So our model is we're dispatchable. So we can either come directly to the scene. So if an officer or a deputy is at the scene and says, oh, you know, this is a, a mental health call and we want a mental health worker or co-responder to come, they'll either let dispatch know, so the 911 operators or dispatch, or they give us a call and we um, meet them at the scene. Or if the officer is able to kind of de-escalate the crisis, like I was saying, and think, well, you know, there's not much work that needs to be done right now, but they need follow-up services, then they'll give us a call or they'll send us an email or a message and ask us to follow up over the phone or sometimes in person with the family the next day or the next week, whatever is appropriate. Um, we also work with, um, so no dedicated commission staff that refers to, we work with patrol units, we work with um, transit staff, we work with negotiators, um, we're not limited. Uh, so how the last slide was saying, you know, one model is where a co-responder is attached to a deputy. We're not like that, so we can do day shift, swing shift, um, all the shifts. So we're not really restricted, and that's why we chose the model that we chose. Um, so program logistics, this is where I'll talk a little bit about the gear we get to. Um, we have funding for six co-responders. We currently have five. The goal is to get get six. So we have two co-responders working the day shift, two working swing, and two working graveyard, and um, provides almost 24-hour coverage, like Ross was saying, between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. We have a gap. Um, we looked at the volumes of calls and just found that between 4 and 7, there's not a lot of work to do, so we chose to have some overlap um, and then a small gap uh, at night. Um, so originally, the program was just focused on the Pierce County Sheriff Department, and we were working and responding to calls only with Pierce County Sheriff deputies. In April 2020, we expanded to be regional. So I think it's 11 jurisdictions in Pierce County that we respond to. Basically, all of the police departments in Pierce County, except Tacoma and Lakewood, we work with, and that's because Tacoma and Lakewood are working on their own um, programs specific to their department. Um, this is also kind of a repeat of, of what Ross was saying, but we are designated by the state of Washington to perform involuntary treatment act evaluations. So we are employees of the Pierce County. We work for Pierce County Sheriff Department, but our employer is MultiCare, and MultiCare is the organization in Washington State that um, that has the contract to. Um, designate mental health workers to be able to do involuntary treatment evaluations and to detain people um, for 72 hours. So it's kind of a combination of, you know, multi-care and, and Pierce County Sheriff Department. Um, so because of that, our training is we spend our first three months training with multi-care to be able to do those evaluations. And then we spend three months training with the Sheriff's Department, with the co-responder team to be able to learn the law enforcement side of things. Um, so gear, we get um, a vest, we have a radio, um, we have unmarked vehicles, we have computers so we can uh, watch the 911 calls as they come in and so we can communicate with dispatch and deputies um, with the messaging system that's on those computers. And then we also have the workspace, so our offices in the Pierce County Sheriff Department. Um, that's about all the gear. We don't have guns or anything like that. So our home base, uh, as I was saying, is in the Parkland precinct of the Pierce County Sheriff Department. It's central to most of Pierce County, so um, we can most efficiently respond to wherever a call comes from. One of the things that a goal of ours is to do monthly in-service training to Pierce County Sheriff Department or other police departments to talk about what we do, to teach uh, law enforcement officers how they can use us and when it's appropriate. With COVID, we haven't been going to those meetings. A lot of those meetings aren't being held, but 
hopefully soon we can start doing that again. Um, the training that we get, um, so kind of going back to our three months of training with the co-responder team, we get trained on we get driver's training, we get trained just basic safety training, and we also do the background check with Pierce County Sheriff Department. Um, and then the last cube there talks about a pretty unique um, kind of benefit that we have. So because we work for multi-care, we have access to um, patients, subjects, medical records, and psych history uh, databases. And because we work for Pierce County Sheriff Department, we also have access to their history of, with law enforcement, their history of 911 calls. So it's a really nice kind of combination of both. We have a really nice picture of a more robust picture of a person because we have access to both databases. That's a really a unique um, part of our program. <clears throat> um, so this slide kind of talks about why this program chose to use DCRs. So again, a DCR is somebody who can um, who can do the ITA and voluntary treatment evaluation and detain a person for 72 hours versus an MHP, which is just a general term for mental health professional, like a social worker or a counselor. Um, so it's it's kind of self-explanatory. Well, no, it's not that self-explanatory because mm -hmm. we get this question a lot. Deputies and officers, they are provided with CAT training. Um, so crisis intervention training, and they can do their own involuntary hold. So the question is, why do we need somebody who can do an involuntary hold when an, an officer can also do that? Um, so two things that come to mind when this question is asked is, first of all, the common misconception is that an officer can do a 72 hour hold and they can't. Their hold is um, for the purpose of transporting somebody to the hospital and then keeping that person at the hospital until they're evaluated by either a doctor or a social worker. And that's usually like six to 12 hours. It's not for 72 hours. And that's why we often see um, people get taken to the hospital and then discharged and then the next night taken to the hospital again. So um, we as DCRs are able to do that evaluation right then and there and complete the 72 hour hold if that is appropriate. Um, the other reason that we chose to do, or that it's good that we have DCRs rather than a mental health professional who cannot do a hold, is um, officers are pretty well trained on how to spot danger to self and danger to others, which are two criteria for an involuntary hold. So if somebody's saying, you know, they want to hurt themselves, they want to hurt other people, it's pretty clear that, okay, well, this person needs to go to the hospital and they don't really need our help making that decision if it's a really high risk situation, but there's a lot of gray areas. Um, there's a criteria called great disability. It's where a person is impaired and can't take care of themselves. And we can, DCRs can do a 72 hour hold based on that criteria, but it's, I don't think in my experience that, um, law enforcement officers are really trained on that. So I'll give an example to kind of illustrate this. Um, I got a call recently to, there was a man who was in a parking lot of a, of a strip mall and an employee called 911 because this person was just acting odd. He wouldn't leave, the business was closing um, and they were really concerned that he's just not well, but there weren't really specifics of what he was doing. Um, so when law enforcement got there, again, nothing was really specific. He couldn't say his name, where he's going, um, why he's there, but he wasn't a danger to himself. He wasn't saying he wants to hurt anybody or himself. Um, he wasn't committing any crimes. So the officers weren't really sure what to do with him, but they knew he needed some help. So they called the fire department to transport him to the hospital. Well, the fire department got there. They took his vitals, his blood pressure was fine, his, um, I don't know what other vitals are there, his heart rate was fine, he didn't have a temperature, so they were like, well, he's, he's fine, he's a healthy, he's a healthy person, we're not going to take him to the hospital. Um, and so it was kind of this conundrum where this person clearly something's wrong, probably needs help, but we don't really have a reason to, to transport him to the hospital. 
So they called um, for a co-responder and I was on shift, so I came out. And um, because of my training and doing evaluations and my past experience working in a hospital, I was able to see that this person is experiencing a psychotic episode, even though he wasn't overtly, you know, talking to people who aren't there and um, kind of exhibiting obvious symptoms, he was experiencing a psychotic episode. And so I was able to write the paperwork um, and begin the 72 hour hold process. And that way he was able to be transported to the hospital. Um, and how that ended is eventually we did find his identity. He did have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. He, when he got to the hospital, you know, kind of got worse and worse. And so he was then transferred to a psychiatric facility and, you know, got the help that he needed. So it's just one example of the unique role of a DCR versus a, um, a DCR hold versus a law enforcement um, evaluation and hold. Um, the other bullet points just talk about, again, how we have history or access to database systems and we can check a person's history. So um, sometimes, again, it's not clear what exactly is going on with this person and if they can tell us their name date of birth we can look them up and say well this is their diagnosis this is you know kind of what's happened in the past and we can give law enforcement suggestions on um, on what to do question <clears throat> how many calls and what percentage of overall police responses are the co-responders dispatched to weekly will alex talk about that well, we'll talk about statistics, but as far as how, how often were utilized, um, I don't have the exact percentage, unfortunately. Yeah, it just it really depends. Question. Some days are really busy. Some days, you know, I don't have enough time to really sit down and eat lunch because there's so many calls. And then other days, you know, I might get one call or just phone calls and I'm not even going out to a scene. So it just depends. I can't even give a good guess of what percentage of calls we go out on. Right. Well, adding to that too, I think it's safe to say probably a high percentage because like Victoria said, we oftentimes aren't able to sit down and eat lunch and there's only one of us on any given shift. So um, if we don't even have time to eat lunch, then they're using us as much as they possibly can. So we need more. You've probably seen yeah. an increase, right? Oh, 100%. For those that have been here for a while, I know that the deputies are starting to get used to mm -hmm. calling and yeah. seeing the response. So exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, it's also hard to say because like Alex was saying, if we're already on a call, <laughs> there might be five other mental health crises going on, but because we're on that one, no one's um, dispatch isn't sending us to other calls. So we don't really know. Um, somebody should do the statistics on that. I agree. We should yeah. figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yeah. It's not, it's Jennifer Hale's asking. Okay. Um, <laughs> what percent, do you have a percentage or breakdown of homeless versus like not homeless in, in terms of? Not, not specific, not on this um, presentation. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm just curious because, yeah. you know, people just assume it's only the homeless that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. but I think it's so, a lot. Wait, I do so bring, low. yeah, I do break down community calls versus resident calls. Okay. And so, and some of the community calls, of course, aren't just people who are homeless, but a, a big majority that, that we do see of community calls are probably safe to assume that they are homeless. Um, not always, though. And then we have the residence calls. So we'll, I'll break that down in a few slides. And it's, yeah, actually kind of even. Oh, okay. And we just started as a department documenting homelessness specifically in our reports so they can pull that data. And I want to say that started maybe six months ago that there's now as the deputies are completing reports and they're indicating whether or not an individual is homeless so they can pull that. Yeah, it'll be good to analyze this. Yeah. And I would say just in my anecdotal experience, I work the graveyard shift and after every call, I um, we use a system where we mark whether they're housed or not. And I would say the majority of my calls are not homeless calls and they're mm -hmm. they're housed. Okay, um, how much of your calls are drug related, legal or otherwise? Mm. That's a good, yeah, I don't have these numbers <laughs> in my head. Um, I, I, Justin's yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so those are kind of hard to um, track because in our system, you know, I think we're, of course, you know, we're tracking who may be um, using substances, 
but I think we're, you know, our, our big track, especially with this team is diversion from ERs and, and jail diversion. And so, you know, I think we don't really have um, a strict number on, on actual um, who's legally involved and who's involved with substances. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there's a huge overlap. Yes, too. Yeah. It's, it's, it's usually not one or the other. They are often. Right. And co-occurring. Yeah, yeah. co-occurring. Even marijuana, which people think of as so benign, but marijuana can make people psychotic. Yeah. A, small, a percentage of our population, they don't know. They think they're chilling out and they're actually getting psychotic. Yeah, and like Ross was saying, our goal is diversion. So often we don't follow them to the, or the, often the person doesn't even go to the hospital. So we don't have a drug screen. Yeah, so sometimes it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, we're getting good at learning, you know, the difference between mental health system symptoms and substance use. But, you know, a lot of them, like we said, overlap. So we don't have specific numbers for that. Oh, we got another one. Uh, question? Yep. Um, legal weed is very high percentage and does result in psychosis. And I don't know. I think it makes more of a statement. Maybe more of a statement. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, we definitely see that. I think there's been studies, especially in teenagers, um, that can cause psychosis. Um, so the next slide is kind of how how we're being used and kind of some of the results of our services. Um, so the first thing is we try to prevent the revolving door of ED visits. So that what that means is what I talked about before. When a person um, is brought to the emergency room, discharged the next night again, brought to the emergency room and discharged. And so what we try to do um, is so a question was even asked about this to bridge gaps between resources. So if a person the only thing they know to do is to call 911 and then go to the hospital. We try to provide them with other resources, so connect them to um, counseling. So we can connect them to in-home counseling, or we can get them set up with virtual therapy or um, outpatient therapy. Um, we can just follow up with them and talk with them on the phone. Um, another way that we prevent that revolving door of ED visits is sometimes people want to go to the emergency department um, when they're having a crisis because they want to talk to somebody. They like talking or it helps them to talk about their symptoms, to help um, talk about kind of what they're going through, and then they feel better by the end of that visit and they go home. So instead of taking them to emergency department, we as co-responders can come to the home and talk to them or talk to them over the phone and they feel that that need has been met and there's no need to go to the emergency department. Um, the next bullet point is about continued education for um, informal training. So. Um, I talked about how we're hoping to do more formal training for law enforcement officers and teach them about symptoms of mental health and substance use and how to recognize those more. Um, but there's also informal training. So when um, when the officers watch us do our evaluations and do our work, they're learning um, kind of what what we look for and they, you know, they learn those symptoms and how to how to help people even without us sometimes. Um, and they also call often and they'll talk about a situation and say, well, this is what I saw. Am I missing something? Is this normal? Is this a mental health issue? And so we'll talk to them and share our knowledge and experience. And that way next time they might even be able to, you know, deal with it without us. Um, the last point is about advocating for in-person contact so we can see the, the problem in vivo. So as, um, as a social worker, when I was an emergency department social worker, we'd often have people who were brought in by law enforcement to be evaluated. And um, in my experience, the person is very different when they come to the emergency department. So sometimes I'll read the police report and it says all these things that this person was doing in the community. But by the time I'm meeting with them as the hospital employee, they've calmed down, maybe they got some medication. Um, they're away from their home, which is where the problem was. And it can be hard to come up with a solution because the person is so different now. And the solutions that we come up with in the hospital might not work as well in the home. And as a social worker, I can't tell whether, whether they'll work or not because the environment is so different and I don't know what's actually going on at home. Um, so the unique thing about this program is that we do that evaluation 
in the home, we see what's actually going on. We see the person while they're having their symptoms. We see how it affects the people around them. And we can come up with plans and solutions while we're there um, that are more likely to kind of address the problem. <clears throat> I think during this slide, uh, I wanted to give an example about a situation that is a good example of hospital diversion. It's one of my first calls that I went on, so it sticks out in my head. Alex and I, Alex can be the next person to talk, actually went on it together. Um, there was a teenager who had written an essay for English class, and in that paper she um, wrote about how she was considering suicide, and she turned that paper in. So her English teacher called 911 and asked for a welfare check. Um, and so when the deputy arrived, the teenager was pretty distressed. She was still feeling suicidal. She didn't want to talk to her parents about it. The parents weren't even aware. So she was pretty, um, it was a pretty risky situation and it would have been very understandable and, and normal for the officer to just transport her to the hospital to be in a safe environment. But this time the officer called for co-responders and um, we showed up and we were able to um, meet with the teenager. Alex talked with the teenager. I talked with the mother outside. I was able to explain to the mother what's going on, kind of coach her on how to properly respond, how, you know, give her some ideas of the best ways to support her daughter. And then when we brought the, the mother and daughter together, um, everything kind of changed. The daughter realized, you know, there's someone that cares about me. My mom can handle this. I feel safe with my mom at home. Uh, we did a safety sweep of the house, got rid of, you know, sharps, medications, did a safety plan, and both mom and daughter felt safe at home, dealing with the issue at home rather than going to the hospital, because that can be a pretty traumatic, um, traumatic kind of experience for, for families. Um, and then when I got back to my office, I was able to make a referral for counseling services and a counselor called the family that night to start the intake process to start setting her up with long term counseling. Um, it's just a good example of, you know, hospital diversion. Not only does it save, you know, money on the hospital bill and time for the staff at the hospital and for deputies, but it also, you know, really helps the family avoid that trauma. <clears throat> um, this is going to be my last slide, just kind of what we do and don't do. So we complete mental health assessments to address the needs of the individual. Um, and often that includes de-escalating the situation and doing some crisis intervention. We assist in providing voluntary treatment options. Um, so those are usually outpatient counseling or connecting somebody to case management if they're in need of like housing, food resources, things like that. Um, our big goal, of course, is diversion from jail or hospitals. We follow up with uh, either people who are at high risk, like that teenager, or high utilizers of services, so the people that call 911 all the time because they don't know what else to do. And then um, kind of a small portion of what we do is um, putting, doing an involuntary detention and doing those 72-hour holds. What we can't do, we can't prescribe medications because we're not doctors and nurses. Um, we're not able to provide transportation to people. We can't drive them to the hospital or wherever they need to go. We're unable to replace the role of a negotiator. So we do work with negotiators and we can um, help educate them again about mental health symptoms to help them figure out what to do. We can provide history on whoever is in crisis, but we're not trained to actually negotiate with with people who are in a crisis and needs a negotiator, like a hostage situation or something like that. We are unable to provide individualized therapy. So for therapy, you know, there needs to be ongoing services and a relationship between the therapist and the client. And because we meet them usually once, sometimes more than once, but usually it's just that one situation. So we can't do um, therapy during that one meeting. Um, and then we're unable to meet clients in the community without a partner. So I can't go to somebody's house just by myself and try to 
solve whatever crisis is going on. Um, I either go with an officer or a deputy, or if we're pretty familiar with the person, sometimes two co-responders will partner up to go to the home and, um, and meet with a person. All right, so I will hand it to Alex. Oh. Okay, we got one question. Oh, one question. Yep. Oh, sure. Um, how do you measure communicate program success? Is there a working plan to continue the program beyond the end of the current grant? I think um, the beginning of the presentation, you guys hit on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the current grants, um, obviously, they're grant funded. So I think uh, our superiors are working on funding in the future and trying to figure out how to sustain the program. It sounds like with the kind of buy-in of the um, different departments and the high utilization of our team, you know, I think it's safe to assume that hopefully we're going to be around for a while. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, well, I guess we'll we'll uh, see what comes of that hopefully soon. But, yeah. Hey, my name is Alex. I am uh, obviously one of the co-responders. I have been a co-responder for about two years with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, um, employees of multi-care. I have been a designated crisis responder in Washington State for several years. I was a DCR in Spokane County and then came over here and continued that role um, in uh, Pierce County. So I'm going to be kind of talking about how we're doing and then looking into the stats and um, how that introduces new challenges and whatnot. So how we're doing um, communication, collaboration and respect among departments. That's been a, a huge um, positive um, between multi, us as multi-care employees and between the Pierce County Sheriff's Department and now that we're regional against other other departments in the um, county. Uh, it's been almost seamless. Um, if right down from us uh, arriving at the scene and them kind of going over what to expect, what the client has been responding well to, um, you know, letting us know that they've already taken away the knife, you know, they've it's, it's just been seamless communication um, and very safe. Um, as a DCR in a different county where, you know, we didn't always have law enforcement with us, um, this is probably the safest job I've ever had. Um, so another awesome thing is the evolution of uh, mental health professional response, the ability to see clients within the community um, and the acuity of the crisis because of the first response nature. Um, given that we're able to respond with law enforcement and that the crisis is either still happening or just recently got de-escalated by the officer or deputy, and we're able to see them in vivo and try to figure out what's the big trigger and how they're communicating and interacting within the home. Um, it's uh, it's just so much more beneficial to see that, whereas, you know, um, previous jobs were able to assess them in the hospital, which is a very nice, secure, fluffy, um, uh, secure situation where oftentimes they've de-escalated and they've even got some medications. And so it's uh, it's so important to see them in the acuity of the crisis. Um, another big thing is easing the transition into services and ensuring people don't fall through the crack. I think that that was a question that was kind of asked earlier is kind of crisis and and um, a crisis setting and then making sure they actually get into services. Of course, we we mitigate the crisis. We figure out what they need and get them into services, whether or not we're making a referral or a follow up. But I think the follow up nature of our team being able to do those follow ups so substantial to make sure that they're actually able to get to that appointment, that they didn't come across a barrier, whether or not that's transportation or communication or the referral that we didn't make. Uh, the person never called them or something um, and just making sure that something else didn't happen between us seeing them and them getting into services. Um, and then the frequent, we have frequent meetings between uh, the team with community partners, funders, Pierce County Sheriff Department leaderships, and that includes anything from um, community partners within the field, um, DDA, uh, people who we frequently see, who we, we have, law enforcement has frequent interactions with, kind of coming up with plans and how to best support them within the community, what's working, what's not working. And of course, our, our peer family leadership and um, them advocating for funding, things like that. Um, locating new clients that not, um, that have only been contacted by law enforcement, but have no recent document psychiatric history. We see this quite frequently actually, where we haven't seen, that person hasn't been in uh, the crisis, our crisis database in 10 years, and but they've had multiple law enforcement contacts um, each year or, or even each week. And um, it, almost, it seems like, uh, you know, they're not quite meeting that threshold to going into the emergency department where law enforcement isn't involved in them, but they see obviously there's something going on and they 
they're, um, you know, they're not able to function within society, society and that they're needing some resources. So we're able to come out there and provide those resources and, and build them into our system and try to advocate for them um, getting into said resources. A uh, big thing is also decreasing 911 high utilizer calls for service and providing them with an alternative resource uh, to stabilize call decrease. Uh, we talked, touched on this earlier that, um, you know, it, it's uh, people are conditioned to call 911 in the midst of a crisis, especially um, if people, you know, are having some sort of psychotic episode or if that's their baseline and they're constantly living in some sort of state of fear and paranoia, their instant thing is to contact um, somebody that they have been uh, uh, conditioned to contact, and that's law enforcement. Um, but oftentimes it could be resolved with a crisis contact with a mental health professional, um, whereas there's not a criminal act going on, but they're still in crisis and they still need some support. Uh, an example of this is we had somebody who called 911, I would say over a thousand times um, within a year. Um, and each time we're able to either follow by phone or by person, um, uh, their calls usually um, ranged in anything from um, I need help or to I'm scared to somebody's breaking into my house um, and to at times when they're in acute crisis to I'm suicidal. And so being able to track that and figuring out what's their baseline and when they deviate from that, when can we step into action and make sure that they're getting either into an involuntary inpatient setting or seeing if we can bridge that gap and get them into resources, which we were able to do when the call volume significantly dropped to I think basically nothing right now. Um, you know, but it, being able to track that and seeing, because um, we also know when, when they're going back into crisis, that's when their call volume starts increasing again and being able to track that as such. Um, and then of course, uh, serv uh, servicing a variety of call types of population. So um, we serve any unit uh, within the Pierce County Sheriff's Department and now regionally, uh, anywhere from SWAT to civil calls to school, um, the school resource officers to code enforcement and to the negotiators. We have a pretty great rapport with, with all of them. Um, they use us quite frequently. The school resource officers use us a, a lot. A good example of this was just a few weeks ago. Um, there was uh, um, a kiddo in, in a crisis, but uh, didn't feel like they were able to communicate with their parents. Um, it, you know, I think that with COVID, we're seeing a lot of kiddos going into these crises. There's a lot of um, isolation and a, an increase in schoolwork in different format. And so they were experiencing a pretty um, a significant crisis. They were suicidal. Um, the school resource officer was able to respond. Uh, was able to de-escalate the situation and uh, kiddo was pretty still pretty guarded and and uh, the deputy was able to recognize that hey um, this person needs somebody to talk to right now and figure out what we can do to best support them we were able to go back go out in the field to come up with a safety plan secure sharps we we're able to build a really great rapport between me and the deputy and the kiddo um, get her into into resources um, you know, next day appointment, so on and so forth. Um, even talking with the family on, on um, like Tori said, how, how to best respond in the situation, what helps her, what doesn't help her, um, and just how to best be a support for her. Um, and uh, as a result, diverting her from even going to an ED. Um, and then of course, decreasing misdemeanor arrests with those with acute mental health um, illnesses, uh, you know, oftentimes where, you know, people are in crisis and either they're, you know, in the wrong place, wrong time, they're supposed not supposed to be on a certain property, you know, they're not supposed to be on their parents' property, uh, so on and so forth, they keep going back, they, you know, lack the insight to know that they're not supposed to be there. Um, and so being able to make sure we're connecting them with the proper resources, sometimes even going to the hospitals um, versus the jails where they, you know, likely won't get the resources there. Um, the hospitals, they'll either one, stabilize and get those resources or, or uh, to go inpatient and, um, and uh, be off the streets for a bit. Um, and then humanizing those with mental health and substance use disorders within the criminal justice system. Again, going back to um, trying to get them back into resources instead of into the, the jail system if legally appropriate. 
Um, so here's where we kind of go into statistics um, a bit. This is, I want to note, this is from 2018, 2019. Um, we don't have our stats for 2020 yet. Um, 2018 is when we started our program. So there was only one co-responder during that, that June 2018 to the end of the year. And then 2019, we only had three. So these stats are from when our program was uh, significantly smaller um, and we only had a day shift and swing. So uh, we have 528 face-to-face -face contacts between 2018 and 2019. A lot of our face-to-face -face contacts, well, all of our face-to-face -face contacts are a result from a deputy um, or officer requesting us to come out to the scene and requesting an evaluation. Um, and uh, again, all the goals that we talked before, you know, doing a whole mental status examination, um, de-escalating the scene, getting them on our radar and figuring out what we can do to help them. That's all of those face-to-face -face contacts, each and every one, we're doing that each time. Um, the th over 1,300 phone contacts seems like a lot, but if you look at our face-to-face -face contacts, most of our face-to-face -face contacts result in a phone contact afterwards, either if it's a, a follow-up um, just to see if they were able to make it to that appointment or it to us making a referral. So a, a lot of phone calls, and a, you know, a lot of tracking and making sure that, you know, um, we were able to bridge that gap. And 59% of those, uh, contacts resulted in referrals being made. 2% um, resulted in emergency detention. That's less than um, 10 of our 528 face-to-face -face contacts. Um, so we're able to divert, obviously, most of them from the emergency department um, and from detention in general. And then less than 1% uh, resulted in arrest. Typically, we don't get called out to somebody who's who's going to be arrested, um, you know, but there are the infrequent times that, that it does result in arrest. Um, where obviously legal legal always will trump civil. Okay, so here we are seeing kind of number of client uh, number of contacts per client. Uh, many of the clients we see more than once, um, either as a follow up or by several calls for service over time. This helps identify kind of service gaps, what's working, what's not working, uh, what follow up did not happen. Um, by identifying service gaps, we're better able to serve the populations um, and hopefully prevent them the constant rotating door of them coming in the emergency department or just the frequent calls for service. Is it always on the responding officer to request a co-responder or are you automatically dispatched on certain kind of calls? Yeah, for the most part, it's it's always on the, the responding officer or deputy to request us. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a situation why they where where they would yeah, and it's it's always them requesting us. Sometimes sometimes 911 dispatch will let us know about a situation. Yeah, like more of an information type thing, just let you know this might come back on your radar or you know, um, if there's a high utilizer, for example, calling in frequently, um, they they and they see that we've um, spoke with them in the past, they might uh, ask us to call them and kind of see um, you know what they're needing and uh, and then try to get them to call us directly instead type, type thing. Um, but that would be like the only situation where we're, uh, yeah, where we're requested, but it's usually. And you guys are working behind the scenes on some of these contacts. So in between your acute calls, you're, right. you're, you're going, okay, um, is this person being connected with such and such and sort of right. bridging that gap a little bit? Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. So if we're not out on a face-to-face -face call, we're probably doing phone call follow-ups. Um, we have a crisis, like our, our back line to our office, which mm -hmm. um, family, we give to family when we outreach and we give to clients. And so oftentimes they'll call the back line if they like, need resources or there's something else that came up and they kind of want to consult and kind of figure out what they need to do next. And so and well, how um, useful is that. Right, right, exactly. So it's, it, it, there's, there's that, there's options. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what we're seeing here with the uh, number of contacts per client, um, obviously uh, the mass majority is one through four. I mean, we're probably seeing clients multiple times throughout the year. Um, and again, trying to figure out like, you know, what worked the first time and what didn't work the first time and what we can do differently the second if we're going back out and also establishing rapport um, and establishing a baseline. Uh, you know, if, if the call doesn't result in them going to the hospital um, or they refuse services um, and they don't meet criteria to go to the hospital, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, and the next call is that they deviate from their presentation in the first. 
and then uh, dispositions, uh, kind of what happens after a co-responder contacts. Most of our contacts either result in a co-responder follow-up or a referral being made. Um, we can see that the large number of contacts resulted in a refuse for services. Uh, though it's, it should be noted that the contacts still provide a significant purpose, and that's putting clients on our radar and establishing a baseline to better and inform future contacts, like I said before. Um, so uh, again, going into the co-responder follow-up, we try to follow up with a lot of our clients to make sure that, you know, again, those gaps between services were filled. Um, and then, of course, the second most is referral given. We do a lot of those, so. Um, I'm going to kind of touch base on this briefly, um, places of service, because I'm going to go into face-to-face -face places of service on the next slide. So right here, we can see Pierce County Sheriff's Department significantly takes over places of service, and that is to, because a lot of our, that encompasses our face-to-face uh, -face and phone. So that's all of our phone calls, and that's all the walk-in um, people at the precinct that sometimes they request us to respond to if like they need some services or things like that. Um, that was kind of pre-COVID though. Um, it, it also encompasses our history checks, our um, outgoing referrals, in-time consultation with deputies, um, and uh, yeah. So the face-to-face -face contacts is gonna be by location. Um, uh, so our highest two is going to be community and the client's residence. The community it can encompass anywhere from homeless encampments to bus stops, to the side of the road, to medical offices, to businesses. It depends on wherever they're having the crisis. And as we know, that is not just in their home. It could be anywhere. Um, you know, if they're not having a good day, they could be out and about in the community anywhere they are. So, um, and then of course the client's residents, um, we often see these in the form of welfare checks, crisis calls, um, suicidal threat calls, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, obviously we're seeing a lot in the community, but the second highest is in the residents. Um, so a lot of them we're seeing in the home. And then also the community could also encompass like if they're um, at yeah, like their parents' house, it's technically that's it's not their residence, that's their parents' residence. So, um, so some challenges that we're going to talk about. So the first one, um, uh, access to information um, uh, or data collecting and sharing between um, agencies, access to information, protected healthcare information, um, and information across database tools is, is pretty limited. Um, but uh, we're able to kind of clarify the continuity of care with the release of information and training to law enforcement. Um, as a crisis worker, we have access to the Pierce County Crisis Database and can provide um, additional information uh, that's readily available for deputies for in-time consultation, kind of um, figure out what they need to do next, if we're, whether or not we're going out to the scene or um, they uh, feel like they can resolve it without us there. Um, another uh, challenge is staffing, uh, difficulty finding strong candidates who have the desire to work in a crisis field um, so filling the co-responder position has, has been difficult. Um, hiring staff has been challenging due to there's a uh, we there's a high need for mental health professionals in the community, and there's a lot of roles to fill, not just in the co-responder program, but throughout different agencies. Um, so uh, as a mental health professional, um, uh, getting candidates is, is very uh, it's uh, very competitive. And so not only do you have to have a desire to be a mental health professional, but you also have to, to, have, to have a desire to work in a crisis setting um, and work with, um, you know, in high acute stress situations and being able to resolve things in the drop of a hatch and, you know, work with law enforcement and work with all the different community providers. So um, being able to uh, find strong candidates that want to do that and feel like that is something that they can do and feel comfortable doing um, can be difficult. Although we, you know, have, have uh, five strong ones are going right now. So, um, so community confusion between 911 system and co-responder between the co-responders and the local crisis line, which is the mobile outreach crisis team, commonly referred to as MOCT. Um, we, so as kind of just some background, multi-care, um, both teams are housed through multi-care. Um, we are a division of uh, within the same department. We're all part of the crisis department. MOCT is um, specifically can be requested by the community, while co-responders can only be dispatched by law enforcement. 
Um, so, you know, I think there's some education on how to use those different systems and um, to family and also providing the crisis line to family because there's sometimes that family doesn't even know the crisis line exists. So they call 911 because they don't know who else to call. Um, and so um, kind of providing that education and figuring out how to uh, how to best um, uh, support the community in that. Um, along with, of course, some psychoeducation um, and trying to figure out, you know, how, you know, they can use the back line to educate and to kind of manage non-dangerous crisis situations. So working on resources and again, it goes back to research gapping. Um, and then, of course, different funders have a different definition definitions of diversion. Uh, as you can see, we have different funders from the WASP grant to the True Blood grant to, you know, the, um, the county. So it's three different funders and all of them have different definitions and trying to figure out how that um, can be tracked and, uh, you know, how we can make sure that we're meeting all the different definitions of what they're looking at. Um, so a big solution that we have is data collecting and sharing between agencies. Um, even created a new uh, way to obtain those statistics where we all, you know, every call we go on, we enter it into a database system so they can track it in one spot. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in, in summary, um, so the co-responder co program originally was funded based on the needs of the community. Um, and unincorporated Pierce County. Pierce County decided to seek funds uh, to address the rising mental health concerns within the community, exploring diversion to those with acute mental health disorders and substance use disorders from the jails and emergency departments. Uh, the beginning of the program, Pierce County Sheriff's Department Co-Responder Program was created with the community partnership between the Mobile Outreach Crisis Team Services within Multicare and uh, within Pierce <coughs> County. Um, uh, it's developed over time from just one co-responder to three to six. Um, Pierce County uh, Sheriff's Department was accepting and excited about the program, potential positive impact it had on the community, vulnerable populations and law enforcement and responding to increasing mental health issues, um, noting that, you know, of course, there has been a significant buy-in that we've seen from all the deputies and officers who have utilized us right from when we went regional we saw that call increase there was they did not shy away from utilizing us uh, and we were happy to have that happy to say that we were readily accepted um, so then program logistics uh, we revolve around the community collaboration respect among depart departments um, they've been again extremely supportive we have six co-responders two day two swing and two graveyard um, and then uh, collaboration. Oh, sorry. And then, of course, we're dispatched from a central location, optimized response time, um, and uh, we provide mental health assessments, price, uh, provide crisis intervention in time, assist with voluntary outpatient options, reduce people from going in and out of the jails and the hospitals, provide follow up, and of course, as, as last means, involuntary detention. And then uh, some contacts to start a lieutenant. Our team, Lieutenant Schaub, and then our Sergeant and Sergeant Moss. Very good. So I'm. We're gonna give some time for questions here because we, you know, people are gonna kind of marinate, and I'm sure they'll have some things. But I, I'm just curious. Um, on, I, I have a two-part question. One is, you know, in, in a perfect world, knowing what you know, I mean, you've all. You have master's degrees in, in mental health. You've, you've been through all that. Um, you've seen, you've been in the you know hospitals and various locations, and you kind of see what's happening on the news right now, okay, where we have acute situations with people with weapons or, you know, really dangerous situations. How would you, with your expertise, right, solve that problem? What, what do you, how, you, how would you see a system in place that could solve that um, a more robust system that would solve that. And then I have a second follow up to whatever you, whatever you, I know it's a put you on the spot, but just maybe some layers in there, what you think would work. And, and, I, and I think I'm going to follow up with that with a question on top of it, maybe that is just kind of expanding it. The, the, the narrative that's out there is why do we have the police that are responding to these calls at all? And there's a lot of, we'll just have social workers go to these calls. Yeah. And that, and I, I'm really interested to hear from social workers, mental health professionals, yeah. 
because that has not been out there. You stole my follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, thought was, I thought it was really building on that one. I was going to build. I was going to come in oh, with a hammer. Chief. Sorry. Oh, I yes, thought it was right. exactly it. So okay. anyways. No, those are you, great. You got what we're Yeah, on. those are great questions. Um, yeah, I think that um, doing this work, um, I know you've been doing it for what, 10 years, but doing this work, I think it's it's important to have that collaboration piece. I think that, that continues to be super important. Uh, for not only the safety of the scene, safety of us, safety of the clients, family, what have you, it, it's important to continue that. Um, you know, as a mental health professional, I can tell you that when I was a mental health professional in um, Spokane, there was times where I went out on a call by myself, well, with a partner, not an officer, and there was times I, I wish I had one. Um, you know, I've been assaulted before. Um, it, so there, there are situations where you, you know, our protocol as a mental health professional, I'm not going to put hands on. Um, so I think that there's the collabor collaboration piece is so huge here mm -hmm. that there, you know, we bring a certain level of expertise, but same with uh, the law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. I've learned so much being on this team that, you know, as a mental health professional, uh, you know, I thought I knew a lot and then going into the community with a different setting and um, in the midst of an acute crisis, because they just called 911. Obviously, there's still a crisis going on. Um, that I think that uh, kind of building really on that collaboration and teamwork. Um, yeah. Yeah, my mind went a little blank on it. I was thinking about all these different scenarios. I, um, one of the things that I love about responding with the deputies is that we can come, it's almost like two parents, that you can have two perspectives. So with the with the law enforcement person there, kind of keeping an eye on things, I feel so relaxed that I can be my best, you know, and, and engaging with the person while I'm not looking. Are they do they have a knife hidden somewhere? Or, you know, somebody in the room coming around behind me, and then being able to kind of step away and make a collaborative decision. What did you see? What are you thinking? Um, so it is really, I did it 10 years without law enforcement and it has completely reinvigorated me. I would say also because I typically saw people at the emergency room, so they're out of the crisis. And it's easy to kind of minimize the situation because they've been at the emergency room for seven hours and they're fine now. I wasn't there in the middle of it when, you know, the deputy was talking them off the ledge for an hour. Um, I think one of the things that I appreciate too is that we try to um, respond to be available in case an officer can use us. Um, we had somebody that was on the, the Narrows Bridge um, going to jump just a couple nights ago. And so Victoria and I drove over there. They didn't want to talk to a mental health person, um, but eventually the, the officers were able to grab the person. Then we collaborated, got all the information about what was going on, and we're able to communicate that to the hospital. So just you're kind of uh, do some of the gaps. And so I, I guess what I'm hearing in your answer is this whole team concept. Yes. And so as I've looked at what San Francisco is doing now, what Eugene, Oregon is doing, that that maybe the our our, our policymakers need to be considering yes. these team models that for certain calls that we are, are sending teams, not just right. officers in. Um, obviously, there's going to be those scenarios where someone's chasing someone else with a knife, and those are going to be times when you probably aren't going to want to be there um, until maybe, you know, after just that. chill in the car. You maybe. chill, yeah. wait until that's done. <laughs> yeah, and, and those, are the, those are so dynamic um, and so many layers of, you know, we have, we, we have, we watch football games and we see every, you know, if somebody's knee, right, it hits the, it hits the white line and we know exactly if he got the yeah. touchdown, right? Oh, yeah. We can dissect it. We can call back east right. to New York and we can say, hey, was that a touchdown or not? But we, we don't have that benefit. We have snippets of cell phone videos and body cams to kind of patch it together. So it can be more difficult. But there are a couple questions that came in. Yeah, sure thing. So what is the total cost for funding this program currently? Oh, I don't think I even really know that. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I do not have the answer to that. I know, no, I'm trying to look at the funding. We can probably, I'm sure it's in That's the county budget. Um, yeah. 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 In the well, county budget, I'm sure it's but the budget. Because I know that the, the county, yeah. the one position, the county, county funds is um, <clears throat> 70,000 a year. 
and I, I cannot. I, Which we don't get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, okay. Yeah, and then um, I, I don't. I, I don't remember how much the WASPIC grant or the triple A grant is. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, we can we question. can look at that. Yeah, we can yeah. follow That's up with question. that. Um, okay, so another question: Is the use of co-responders fairly uniform around the county, or are some areas more likely to use this service? Curious where UP falls on the spectrum. Oh, mm -hmm. that is good. As far as do you break it down by agency at all? By agency, as in terms, terms of where you respond. No. no, no. So that's why where our location is Parkland is because that's like central Pierce County, and so obviously Parkland uses us a lot because we're right there. Um, but I mean, Gig Harbor. I, I mean, we go out Key Peninsula, Bonnie Lake. We're kind of everywhere. It, the, the only caveat to that is that you know it takes us sometimes forty five minutes to get there. Yeah. Um, so I think it kind of depends on the scene and the situation. Um, and also, I think it also depends on on how many um, deputies or law enforcement officers are are in the um, that jurisdiction and how long they can wait. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this crisis situation and. Uh, and they can wait for us, they will. But if it, if they can get them to the emergency department and that's the appropriate, then that's what they got to do. Yeah, we're kind of everywhere. I would say with um, University Place specifically, um, the, those officers are great about contacting us. And sometimes yeah. we're consulting on the phone mm -hmm. about a situation or I'll start heading that way just in case. Um, I could be used, and before I get there, they say, you know, we're going to take them to the emergency room. But um, yeah, we've we've had really uh, dynamic uh, interactions with with the university place and uh, the others. I, I think kind of piggybacking off that too is that since we do have access to their dispatch system, if there's a call that we notice that is kind of mental health related. Um, you know, even if they haven't called us on it yet, we'll kind of gravitate, and we're not busy, obviously, we'll kind of gravitate towards that area. Yeah. So we're closer if they need us, especially if we know that, okay, I know that deputy, he's probably going to call me. So that's awesome. So we kind of are in that area, so we're quicker. So we kind They've of. also done, I don't know if this is actually the exact question, but um, we also do a lot more phone consultations mm -hmm. because they'll say, this is what I'm seeing, or this is what I saw. Tell, tell me if you think that that's a good resolution or, or you know, that's pre-resolved right now. I don't think you need to come out, but would you mind calling them? Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. Mm -hmm. If it's so stressful, why do you do it? Oh. <laughs> that's, a that's a good question. I, I, I think that um, I, being able to manage a crisis and being able to help people within their crisis, um, it, it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, that it is um kind of helpful to be able to do that and be able to advocate for people when it comes down to this job i think a big component is advocacy and um and it's kind of all we want to do is to make sure that we're advocating for the client make sure that they get help and that we're able to have some sort of resolution for that person uh, so i know that's why I, I personally like to do it and i think that it's um you know part of my personal philosophy is, is to be a, the biggest advocate i can for for the population we serve. From the sidelines here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it's stressful, but I think all of our personalities, we kind of get bored quickly yeah. maybe, and we sometimes like the stress. Stressful in time, but I don't think, um, we often don't take that stress home and it's just something new every day that we get to do, um, a new challenge. Every day is different. And I think um, the people who take this job enjoy that. And I think for me, I did it for um, 11 years going out and doing the mental health evaluations um, without law enforcement. Every once in a while, it involved law enforcement. And I wasn't getting stagnated, but w once I went with law enforcement, it completely invigorated me. And I think the idea of not only being in the middle of the crisis and then seeing some kind of resolve, but also having the law enforcement as a partner so they're watching from one perspective and I have one perspective and then we can come together and talk it is so, so rewarding and so satisfying that, um, yeah, for the 13 years I've been doing this job in general, these last two as a co-responder have, have been a highlight, which is, is really great. I think also just seeing, helping people in the moment of their crisis mm -hmm. and also taking a little bit off of law enforcement. Cause I can kind of see them relax a little bit yeah. when we show up because they can kind of step back 
and watch, you know. Yeah. And I would say there's a there's a misconception in the public that law enforcement is just completely ill-equipped. Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> with, the, with the ability to handle crisis. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective, um, because I think the public thinks, oh, well, they just, they don't know what they're doing. Well, I, I want to start this one. Sure. I, they, <laughs> they are so much better at de-escalating people than I am, because I am typically asking them the questions that might get them angry. You know, like, uh, and so my job is to kind of poke and see if there's a mental illness that this person's at risk. We don't want to just calm them down and soothe them so that, you know, we walk away and then something tragic happens. And so to have that balance of them being this, they're amazing at de-escalating and, and bringing a calm and, and organizing and stuff. And then I go in there and start poking, you know, to see if a fire will, will spark up. Um, so I, I, it is, it's reinvigorated me as a professional um, working with, working with law enforcement and having that partnership. Right. It's like a marriage. Right. Healthy. But I think even going off that, um, I, I think that obviously I'm a big fan of advocacy. I think I've said that like five times, but um, that starts with the deputy requesting us. If they didn't advocate for us to be on scene, we wouldn't be on scene. For that, they they know when it's needed. They know, and and when it comes down to it, them even asking us to be there is them wanting that person to have some sort of resolution that doesn't result, result in them going to the jail. Um, so I think that you know they're able to recognize that, and they're able to recognize that. You know, obviously we know all, all of us know that there's system gaps and that our mental health system is far from perfect. And so them just advocating for this team, this program, and utilizing us as they do. Um, and then, you know, being able to give us, you know, um, the lowdown when we even get there, what, what their triggers are, um, you know, what, what the mental health symptoms are, yeah, right down to using our own clinical terminology. Uh, we get there and they, they have, have it laid out for us. Yeah. Um, so, very good. A couple more questions coming in. Uh, what do you do to avoid burnout? Good question. That's okay. For me, um, because I this is my 13th year as a, a designated crisis responder, so working with law enforcement has actually been what's kept me from being burnt out. Um, the fact that a lot of times law enforcement could go out and just resolve it one way or another, send them to the hospital or just trespass them, whatever. But that the it starts off with the fact that the law enforcement cares enough about this person to wait half an hour, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour for me to arrive and then wait while I'm there talking to the person uh, is so rewarding and it is so invigorating. Um, and then to be able to talk with another professional from that perspective, what do you see? What do you think? This is what I'm thinking. The collaboration has really um, rejuvenated and re reinvigorated my interest in doing it. So I, I haven't been burned out at all. I was probably more burned out before I started working with law enforcement. Yeah, yeah well, I definitely agree. And I think that with any clinician, whether or not it's in this this um, type of team or a different crisis situation, or even as a, a you know therapist, I think it's super important to have really good self care, really good supports. Um, I think that that's part of it, even within our team. Um, you know, if there's a hard case, if I, you know, if there, if there was any sort of um, you know, I was worried about a case or I need a consult. Not only do I have um, my colleagues, my fellow co-responders to talk about it with, um, and I have that uh, trust with them, but I also have it with uh, the deputies. Um, and I think that there, you know, there's a closeness working with them where we all kind of check in on each other because we all know that we have this high stress job and that we're all witnessing things that, um, I, you know, I think the average bear doesn't witness. And so I think just kind of stopping and checking in on each other, um, and that's I think what we do. And then personally, uh, you know, self care is super important. Um, just even in the home, having somebody you can talk to, having hobbies. Um, I have two dogs that I'm obsessed with, and I go on hikes regularly. I think that's just super important to um, leave work at work, and when you're home, do your own thing, and just be silly and goofy and whatnot. And you guys may not know this, uh, we do have Dr. Thompson next week. She is a, um, from the sheriff's office, you may know her. She's doing all the wellness discussions with the sheriff's deputies. She's the clinical doctor. 
And she's going to talk to the public about, about just the current state of affairs yeah. and, and how officers are, you know, what she's treating them for and what they're, what kind of hazards they're hitting. Maybe you all should listen to that class. That's a good idea. Yeah. 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 And uh, we, yeah. we'd love to have you. So, okay, we got a couple more things. Um, since mental health is a health, are there any legal obstacles in working directly with PCSD or sharing data? Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously, we have to make sure that it, it's HIPAA compliant. If this is a crisis situation, you know, that's a little, we can share a little bit more information um, among professionals. Um, but we're, of course, very careful with what we do provide um, as long as it's pertinent to the case. Um, so, along those lines, so we have access to a lot of people's medical, general medical records like diagnoses. So what I've done a lot of times is I will be general enough with law enforcement that they know the kind of category that they might be working with. This person might have psychosis. This person might be hallucinating without getting into real specifics, which the law enforcement, they don't really want to know anyway, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it, it really has, I, would thought, I thought it would be more of a problem, but it really, it really hasn't been. Exactly. And I think David was making a comment here, and I think it was when Ross, when you were talking a little bit about um, your how you were learning from the law enforcement, how they're they're kind of good cop, bad cop. And he said, "Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting perspective. Thank you. I think I'm sold on co-responsibility." Oh, that's, <laughs> so, that's um, fantastic. Okay, so yeah, I am too. Uh, and if I misinterpreted that, David, let me know. Um, okay, so one more, another question here. Hold on, I keep getting these pop-ups in the way of my question. Does the responding officer ever leave after the person is calm and seemingly under control? If so, what happens if they become violent, out of control, and you have no deputy officer there and you have no tools to protect yourself? That, that's a great question. They're, they're typically are on scene with us. Yeah, they don't leave. Yeah. I did have at the very beginning, I think there was a little misunderstanding and um, the deputies would, would introduce me and then kind of leave. And um, if I had felt threatened, I would have stopped and asked them to, to stay. But the policy is that they stay mm -hmm. with us, which I think has actually been part of the beauty of the program is because not only do we now have two perspectives looking at a situation, but I think that we learn from each other because then after the situation is over, I always end up talking mm -hmm. with the officer. And oftentimes, especially when the program is brand new, they would ask me questions or they would tell me what they observed and and run through things like i saw this were you thinking this and so it's nice to see that they're becoming more mental health aware by the interactions mm -hmm. yeah it's really fascinating okay guys any more questions we're kind of looks like we're running out of questions and we'll give you just a few more minutes here to chime in if there's anything otherwise we can wrap up unless you guys have anything to add or, or chief well, if you have anything i wanted to thank people for even taking the time to tune into this that's fantastic you know the, the fact that people in our community want to know more about the community and how to advocate for the community um, is is really uh it's incredibly encouraging so thank you for doing this all of you thank, thank you, you. Yeah. yeah chief did you have anything to add or i can Close it up on, okay. on my end here. All right. Well, it looks like we're okay. we're about out of questions. Oh, 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 everybody's just saying thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Nice. Okay. Let me just mute mine so we don't get any echo here. Oops. Can't get to my um because there's so many thank yous coming in. I think people can hear me now. I hope so. All right. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to make a couple of closing comments. Um, I think there was a question or, or, or comment about how do we uh, evaluate the program to determine whether or not it needs to continue to be funded. And I think you, if, if this went before a council, you're going to have a long line of deputies and officers waiting to testify because as uh, I look back to my, I, I don't work the streets anymore, obviously, uh, as a chief. But I think back to my time in patrol and how many times I was at a crisis situation and was begging for somebody with that expertise and really uh, looking at having that resource. It's, it's almost a necessity nowadays. I mean, just as we talk about the amount of mental health 
crisis issues that are a part of what we do on a daily basis, uh, having that resource is a, is a necessity anymore. So finding that funding is going to be critical. Um, I did look at the budget really quick. Um, and don't, so no, no, nobody quote me on it, but it looks like it's about 700,000 a year for the program. Um, it's a it's a two year budget, so it was a little over 1.4 million. So I'm saying a little over 700,000 a year is what it looks like, at least on the county side. I don't know if there's other grant parts that get paid in there, but that so don't quote me, but that gives you at least a general idea of of what that that funding component was. So um, I think that was it. Thanks again, Ross, Alex, Victoria, for your presentation, um, and thanks everybody for tuning in uh, tonight. Um, I think. Next week is our last week of the Academy um, and we're looking forward to that. And I'm going to go ahead and close it up for tonight. Everybody have a good week and good weekend. Thanks for being here. Bye.